knows Mike Singletary, every Hall of Fame imaginable from Texas high school football, Texas sports, Hall of Fame, college football, pro football. You pretty much have just like checked off all the boxes, haven't you? Well, you know what? I'm I'm just uh, I'm just very thankful that um, you know I've been able to to stay healthy and and accomplish those things, and um, very grateful for that. The Pro Football Hall of Fame is about to have their newest induction, and in fact, it's kind of a double-packed group of people, a lot of different players and coaches and stuff, personalities, those who contributed. What does that mean that weekend, the induction weekend, for those who are members? You know what? It's it's um, it's just a a really um, it's kind of like. Um, when a mom is is pregnant and the kids that they already have you you're so excited uh, about the new baby and and um you you're excited to see <laughs> what it is and and um it's just a welcoming to the family uh for those that are already in the hall of fame it's uh you you remember when you got that call and it's always uh, a tremendous reminder of how grateful you you are when you get that call uh because it is so special and and it is such a wonderful fraternity so uh it's pretty uh, an awesome feeling what do you think they 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 seem to be adding a large group one because they missed last year but also they're trying to play a little bit of maybe catch up to get some that have been overlooked your thoughts about maybe trying to play catch up a little bit um you know i i guess it's one of those things where um they're, they're gonna do what um what they feel they they need to do i, I don't even spend much time trying to figure out, you know, why they're doing certain things, but um, I guess if they're saying, hey, you know, we missed last year, we, okay, I, I get it, I, I understand that, well, we're going to add some more, okay, yeah. I get it, that's what you're going to do. I mean, in any given year, there are are so many players, um, I, I would say they, they always miss a handful every year that's left out and uh, that still need to, to be in there um, by certain respects. So, um, you know, you're never going to get it all right. You're never going to say, oh, okay, great. They got it right this year, and they got everybody in here. There's always somebody that's left out that should be in there. Is there a former Chicago teammate of yours that you feel like should be in? You know, um, when I when I think of the uh, the Bear players, I think uh, Wilbur Marshall comes to mind. Uh, Wilbur Marshall was a great player, and um, you know he left the Bears and went to Washington. And I I think one year he was even player of the year there. But if there's anybody that deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Wilbur Marshall is that guy that um, was an amazing athlete and was absolutely vicious. Um, so um, that that's one guy. That's another bear that um, hopefully down the line here he, he deserves to, to be in there. Mike Singletary also is part of Memo.me. It's a chance for people if they want to get a unique gift for Father's Day to contact Memo.me and then, for example, get in touch and have Mike Singletary send a father or somebody else a, a greeting. You've been a part of that a little bit. Is that some stuff that you just kind of are able to do that, that, that and surprised that how many people may want a piece of an audio clip from you? Well, it's it's pretty cool, you know. Obviously, I I've been uh, doing cameos and and now the the memos and you know cameo has been very good to uh, to me and and uh, you know that's been fun as well. Memo and you know hopefully we just continue to do both of them. All right, what does Father's Day mean to you? Wow, that that's a mouthful, but I'll, I'll try and and um, really. I'll, I'll try and narrow it as much as I can. Father's Day means to me, um, as I strive to serve the Father that we can't see, but we can feel, and we know He's there. 
um, just trying to do everything that I can to honor the God that I call Father. And, um, you know, my Lord and Savior means everything to me. And if I can do my job on earth to raise my kids, be there for them, offer the discipline, as they get older, offer the advice, um, but just do my job and let them know that I am so, so thankful that God allowed them to be in this family so that um, they could be a part of uh, my wife and I, Tim and I, our, our legacy in terms of what we have to contribute to this world. And um, that's what I see it. You have coached at every level possible, including uh, high school football in Texas. And I know the Bears talked to you maybe earlier this year about their defensive coordinator position. Do you still have the dream of coaching again? You know what? I, I believe that right now um, the most important thing, um, I, I'm doing something right now that I really didn't really want to do uh, from a distance. And now that I'm doing it, um, I, I'm really excited about what I'm doing. And uh, that is really trying to help America mend and get back together. I got a program that uh, we're doing in Chicago on the 17th of July. Um, and it's uh, about the south side and west side of Chicago, bringing mm -hmm. them together and doing everything that we can to help them um, get the get the help they need, the love they need, the care that they need to get back in society and and, and make America healthy uh, everywhere. So um, that's what I'm doing right now. As far as football is concerned, if, if God opens the door, I'll know of Him and I'll walk through it. Mike, the country, of course, the last year and a half, it's been difficult. It's been difficult for a long time. It's always there's something. But as someone like yourself that loves America, that loves uh, God, that, that loves people and that people love you, um, how difficult at times was it for you to see sometimes how fractured this country was? Well, it, it was it was tough. But, but uh, at the same time, I, I also understand that Sometimes you, you really don't know how badly something is broken until it actually breaks. And you take a step back and you look at it and you go, wow, I, I thought we were better than this. I thought we were closer than this. But it, 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 it's, um, it, it's a painful thing sometimes to see the truth of how far we are apart. But I, I really do believe, and I really do believe this in my heart, that we're closer than what we saw. And I, I really believe that uh, there, there's a handful of people out there that don't want it to work, uh, but there are more people out there that, that want it to work, that want America to be great. Um, and um, hopefully we can get it right this time. What is one thing about Michael, Mike Singletary that people might assume is true that may be more myth than reality? Wow. Um, that, that question took a lot of turns. <laughs> <laughs> I can get in trouble on that one. <laughs> what is something about Mike Singletary that people may think is true, but in reality is not? Is that correct? Yeah, and it, and it could be football. It could be your intensity as a person. It could be what I, it's kind of wide oh, okay, open. Okay, okay. I, I, I would say that the biggest misconception that people have with me that they think is true, most everybody I meet, I would say 95% of the people I meet say after they meet me, wow, you're really a nice guy. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know that. So, uh, I mean, you're really a nice guy. So, uh, you know, you don't yell at people. You, you don't, you know, you, you're not going to snap any, you're not going to snap at anybody. Um, but you, you're really helpful. You're really kind and you're really nice. Wow. 
So that's what I hear most of the time. You know, I've always had the, uh, I'm, I'm of the opinion that you, you know, you hear about, well, that guy is this or that girl is that or that person is that. And then I go, well, if you never met them, you can only go by what others are saying. That doesn't mean it's true. It's better to meet somebody and then form your own opinion. Do you feel like it's because of those eyes and because of the way and how ferocious and violent you played the game? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely do. Um, you know, when you have guys on the other team asking you, what are you taking? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and getting angry at you when you tell them, I'm not taking anything. Yeah. Oh, so you're not going to tell me the secret. So you're not going to say, no, I'm not taking anything, man. I'm, I'm telling you, I don't take anything, nothing. So uh, that, that part of it was pretty funny. Uh, they they wanted to get some too, <laughs> oh, but uh, but anyways, I, I say hey, it, it's just the Lord, man. It's just the passion that He gave me, and uh, that's it. The uh, the eyes that you had, and you know the famous pictures of you on the other side of the line of scrimmage. Do you feel like you ever intimidated a quarterback by just your glare, your look? Never intentionally. It's amazing how much I hear that. Oh, he's trying to intimidate. Mm-hmm. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm trying to see every little key that I possibly could. That's it. And and as far as the other stuff, I mean, I, I never tried to intimidate anybody. I mean, I, how am I going to intimidate anybody? I'm small as one of the smallest guys on the field. So um, I, I just think that um, – Everybody thought that was the intent, but actually I was I was working, man, trying to trying to get my keys right. What is the feeling like for you when you had a collision, college or pro, and you broke a helmet? What did you feel? Um really to be honest with you, I, I really felt like, man, why do I always get the bad helmet? <laughs> Really? Why, why, what kind of helmet are they giving me? you got to be kidding me. I, I, why do I get the defective helmet? Um, nobody else is breaking helmets. Well, why, why am I the only one breaking helmets? I mean, this is ridiculous. That was my thought process. And, and, and do you remember how many, I mean, do you know off the top of your head how many you cracked? There were a number of helmets that I didn't even know they were cracked. Oh, uh, okay. The next day I got another helmet. And, uh, you know, Skip Cox would say, well, he got cracked. Um, and I'm like, what? Really? Yeah, it was cracked on the side. We can't let you play with that. And then there there were some that were just obviously cracked right down the middle like an egg. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it, it, it just happened. You've told me many times the influence that Grant Taft had in your life and so many others. And recently when I sat down with Coach Taft, you told me about the, the speaking engagements and what that meant and what he was trying to, to teach you. What did Corky Nelson teach you and how intense was he and how much did he get you fired up? You know, um, the, the sad thing about people like Corky Nelson is they never ever get the accolades that they deserve. Corky, to me, was one of the greatest coaches that I've ever been associated with. He was absolutely amazing. He knew how to push your button. He knew what he wanted. He had a game plan as to how to get it. And right today, anytime I go anywhere, um, when there's another linebacker that Corky Nelson coached and we're in the same room, uh, nine times out of ten, we're going to find each other and say, you're coached by Corky Nelson, and there, here, here comes the story. Mm-hmm. To me, that that is the mark of a tremendous coach. I mean, too many coaches, but nobody have anything to say about, oh, that guy? Oh, man, he didn't know what he's doing. But Corky Nelson, if, and I know for a fact, you know, as tough as it was, as some days, as horrible as I thought it was, what a gift for God to give me to be able to have him as my college defensive coordinator and college coach. And um, he and, and um, 
you know, Coach Taff or just a tremendous blip for me. Did you ever have a chance to, to tell Coach Nelson exactly that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I asked you about the helmets, Mike Singletary, Hall of Famer in every way. Memo.me is also a part of this interview and what we have with Father's Day coming up. Was there ever a hit? Like, I've asked Earl Campbell, what was the hardest hit he could remember? And, of course, he's delivered a bunch of them, but there was the Jack Tatum hit at the goal line. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was, like, I'm surprised both of them just, like, they weren't, like, they didn't evaporate. Was there one in particular you remember the most out of the hundreds or maybe Maybe thousands of collisions you had. You know, um, I'm going to tell you one of the toughest guys. And this is, this makes me very proud to to say this uh, because he's also a friend. But uh, Dennis Gentry, I broke two helmets in the same practice on Dennis Gentry, and Dennis Gentry is just a little guy. Yep. A little running back, but let me tell you something. When when Corky wanted somebody that was going to block, he called Gentry. I don't care where Gentry was on the field. He's, where, 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 where's Gentry? He knows what I'm talking about. And Gentry would come down there and would run as hard as anybody. Would run over you. Um, was a tremendous competitor. And for a small guy... Uh, he was a guy that, hey, you have to take notice. You have to buckle up your stuff if you're going against Gentry. And so Gentry was the guy I love practicing against Gentry because you know you're going to get better. He's going to give you everything you had. And so that that practice, I'll never forget, we had two practices. I mean, we had one practice, um, and I think it was two a day. One practice, I cracked two helmets, split them straight down the middle, and it was Gentry. And, and, of course, you played in the NFL with him. He was a part of those 85 Bears. Everyone talks about you or Dan Hampton or whoever else, Steve McMichael. But guys like him were just as tough, huh? Oh, man. There's, there's no doubt. When you got guys like Dennis Gentry on, on your backup team and on special team, mm-hmm. he was a monster on special team. And so when you got the quality – quality special team players like Dennis Gentry, man, your special team is going to be great. A couple more things, Mike, and we appreciate your time. I asked you about maybe one hit, and you mentioned Dennis Gentry in practice. Was there a specific game that, you know, maybe one that everyone thinks was your favorite game, or is there a game that, that stands out at Baylor more than any other game? Um... Wow. It stands out in Baylor more than any other game. I would say probably um, Texas A&M when I think they came to Waco and uh, they had uh, George Woodard and uh, oh, yeah. Dickey and, and they were a pretty hot team and they came to Waco. It may have been my junior year or something like that. I, I think this is correct. I could be wrong, but I, I they may be getting the year wrong, but they came to Waco and we beat them. And um, it was a tremendous, tremendous um, victory for our our team, the university, um, and, for, and for, you know, the status of our, our team. We, we kind of moved up the, the chart there a bit uh, because we beat uh, we beat a very good football team, a very talented football team um, at home, uh, at our home, and that um, was a great day. You know, um, you command respect. It's not like you say you must respect me, but people respect Mike Singletary. That doesn't mean everybody agrees with you or likes your style or whatever, but that's the what that's because we're all human and not everybody thinks that someone's perfect. But you seem to command that respect. Why? Maybe because I give it. I think um one of the things that I, I really appreciate about some of the my teammates is um you know, my junior year, my senior year, even my sophomore year, 
uh, when there are players that came in and they were rookies or what have you, freshmen, um, and somebody was trying to pick on them or, you know, I would always step in and say, we're not doing that. Don't do that to him. That, that's not right. I wouldn't want anybody to do it to me. I don't want you to do it to him. So they may, well, 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 why does it matter to you? Because anytime I see any injustice anywhere, I'm going to step in. Um, because it's, it's not right. It's not right here. It's not right on the field. It's not right in my family. It's not right anywhere I see it. I'm going to step in and I'm going to say something. That's my nature, and that's what I was taught as a kid. Uh, we need more of you. Well. I mean, that's kind of well, what you're trying to do now, though. Isn't that kind of what you mentioned, Chicago and this country, and, and you're trying to, to maybe help people heal and get better and, and, and maybe understand everybody better? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think that uh, we've got to spend more time being more conscious of, of others rather than thinking of, you know, how I feel about everything. I, I think um, as a country, we need to do a better job putting ourselves in, in the shoes of others and and trying to figure, I mean, I find myself, you know, judging people. I mean, why, why don't they go get a job? Why don't they do this? And I, and I catch myself say, you know what? Mind your own business, number one. Number two, do you have any idea, any idea, how they how they got to that point? Do you know what happened in their life? Do you know their story? Then shut up. It's okay. All right. You're, you're exactly right. I'm, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Mind my own business and make sure that I keep doing the things that, that I need to do to stay out of harm's way and, and try to make our country better than it is. Did you ever think about or did anyone ever ask you to run for office or is that something you'd want to do? No. No. Um, no, I, I don't. Uh, I'm not. I don't have the patience mm -hmm. for politics. Uh, I don't have the. Um, <clears throat> I'm not a politically correct guy. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not very good at that. I had someone bring this up that uh, they remembered when you were in college and when they were there, or perhaps it might have been a brother-in-law or someone else, that football players would lead Bible studies at Penland Hall and that you were a part of that, among many others, and it always meant so much to them because you guys were involved in that. Do you recall that and, and what that meant to you as well? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, at every stage of my life, um, you know, God was always involved. Um, and not all, all the time I was following him like I should. But I always knew that if, if I'm going to go anywhere in this life, God has to be the foundation of it. And um, without that, I'm fooling myself to think that, you know, I can be successful over here but screwing up over here. To me, uh, success is all about consistency. If I'm successful on the field, then I, I need to be cons um, successful in the classroom. And if I'm successful in the classroom, I need to be successful in, in my relationships. And it, to me, it all ties together. There's no compartmentalizing success. Uh, same way I look at it as as a dad. I'm I'm not successful as a football player. Um, failure as a dad. No, either either you are Hall of Fame uh, football player. Well, you know what? That requires you to be a Hall of Fame dad. The same stuff that I put in on that field, I need to put in in my relationship with my wife. I need to put in the relationship with my kids. If I'm not doing that, then I'm cheating. I'm I'm cheating. I'm leaning too much on one of them and I'm robbing the other two. And and that to me is when we uh, we get in harm's way. When you received that scholarship offer from Baylor, I don't know if anyone else had actually offered you a scholarship back in the day. Was there one school that you always wanted to offer you 
coming out of high school? Yes. I wanted to go to Oklahoma. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I, that, that's another story. There was a guy named Durfee Thompson. I was telling my daughter about this yesterday. Um, Durfee Thomas um, was a guy that uh, when I was in high school, my junior year, we were getting ready for spring practice. And Durfee Thompson uh, saw me. And uh, first of all, my, my teammates had been trying to talk me into playing safety, a cornerback, because I was too small. They were telling me, I, you know, first of all, my high school had never, no one had really gotten a scholarship from my high school to a Division One school. So um, my teammates were telling me, Mike, you need to play cornerback or you need to play safety so you can get a Division One scholarship. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. You're too small. Um, but I said, I'm playing middle linebacker. I love the position. That's what I'm playing. And I'm going to get a D1 scholarship. It's okay. You're dreaming. So um, one day, um, my teammates came and got me out of my class. I said, Mike, you got to come see this guy. You got to come see this guy. This guy just got cut from the NFL. He is like 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, He's like 240 pounds. He just got cut, Mike. I'm telling you, you got no chance. And so I looked at the guy, he was in the weight room, he was lifting everything we had in there. And so I looked at him and I go, wow, okay. Uh, I was thinking to myself, <laughs> they kind of have a case, but I, you know, he's not me and I'm not him. I'm still gonna play middle linebacker and I'm gonna get a D1 scholarship. So I go out to practice that day, spring practice. After practice, this is the only guy I only see him one time in my life that day he came up to me and he said Mike he said let me let me tell you something if I had what you had at your age I would still be playing wow so he said you got what it takes man you got it and he said when um, Oklahoma is going to come to you next year and offer you a scholarship. Take it. Because it, it, it is a school that I wanted to play at. I never did, but my guy, my buddies tell me about that school, and they say, man, it is, it is a dream to play at Oklahoma. So that next year, um, you know, I prayed, and I, uh, at the beginning of the year, Baylor comes. And they offered me a scholarship. And, and I prayed. I said, Lord, the first school to come, that's where I'm going. Mm. And so Baylor happened to be the first one. And um, then the University of Texas offered me. Um, at the end of everything, those were basically the only two schools that offered me a scholarship. And at the end, when signing date was just about do and everything else, Oklahoma comes. And there's a guy at Oklahoma, I don't know who he was, but he's a scout he had on about three bowl rings. And he came there and he um, he came and got me out of my class and everybody was like, wow, that guy's from Oklahoma, Mike. Man, you got a, you're gonna get a scout from Oklahoma. And so the guy comes and gets me and he takes me down to the uh, library. And he said, uh, so, you uh, you don't want to go to Baylor, do you? <laughs> you, you? You want to be a preacher, or a doctor, or something? And um, I said, "Well, sir, I I, um, I I went to Baylor. I visited, and at that time, I had made my decision. I called Gustav and told him I'm coming to uh, Baylor. So he said, "So, well, Oklahoma wants to offer you a scholarship. It's one of our last scholarships." And he just knew I was going to take it. So he says, so what do you think about that? And I said, well, sir, I said, I really appreciate that. But I'm going to Baylor. And he looked at me and he said, son, did you not understand what I just said? I, I just told you Oklahoma is willing to give you a scholarship. Now, do you want it or not? I said, no, sir, I don't. I am going to Baylor University. I gave Coach Taft my word that I'm going to Baylor University, and that's what I'm doing. He started swearing. He started cursing. He called me an idiot. Um, that I had no idea what what was happening. 
and um, walked out. I wonder um, if Coach Switzer ever heard that story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's an interesting one. Wow. Well, I have to ask you about Baylor football one more time as far as what they have now. Dave Aranda, you know what he did at LSU. Their defense was really good last year. They just never could get off track offensively. And then a couple of years ago, they had a great defense that went to the Sugar Bowl. Didn't win, but they were really good under Matt Rule. Do you see Baylor's defense? Watch them play, and are you proud of what you see? You know, anytime you see a defense fight Mm -hmm. and play hard, play together, that, that's always exciting to see. You know, I wish him nothing but the best. Mike, I've interviewed you over the years. Uh, I've been fortunate to interview you a handful of times, maybe 10 or 12 times in the last 10 or 12 years. It seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you might be more at peace with things now than perhaps ever. Well, I'll, I'll put it like this. I, I really believe that um, where I am right now, I, I believe that, you know, sometimes you, you settle in a place. And I believe that God has me exactly where he wants me right now. And I'm at peace with that. Memo.me. Mike Singletary, some of the great celebrities and entertainers. You can contact Memo.me and get them to send something to a father for Father's Day. Mike, thank you so much. Enjoy your trip. Hope to see you very soon. God bless. Mike Singletary, Hall of Famer across the board on Sikkim 365 Radio. At Baylor University.